Hello and welcome to On the Mathematical Frontline, a special series of the PLUS podcast. My name is Marianne Freiberger. On the Mathematical Frontline was born during times of deepest, darkest lockdown during the COVID-19 pandemic. In this special series of the PLUS podcast, we usually talk to epidemiologists from the Juniper Modelling Consortium who provided essential scientific advice to the UK government during the pandemic. Back in January, we got to meet some of our Juniper colleagues again at an event organised by the Newton Gateway to Mathematics in Cambridge, which was all about communicating mathematics for the public. We gave a talk at the event about our collaboration with Juniper and generally there was a lot of focus on the COVID-19 pandemic and on the importance at the time to communicate difficult mathematical ideas such as exponential growth or the R number, not just to the public at large but also to policymakers who had to make those difficult decisions that were impacting us all and many of whom hadn't done any serious mathematics since their school days. At the Newton Gateway event, we also met Tom Irving, who played a hugely important role during the pandemic at SPY-MO, a group of epidemiological modelers which fed its results to SAGE, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, which in turn advised the government. Tom's journey through the pandemic has been fascinating, and in this podcast, he talks to my colleague Rachel Thomas about his role providing a bridge between policy and mathematics, about the importance of transparency in this process, and about discussing the R number at the hairdressers. What was your role during the pandemic? So my job title, which I kind of made it myself, um, uh, but seemed to fit, was the co-head of the Secretariat for SPY-MO, which is the uh, uh, SAGE's modelling subcommittee. So uh, there was a team of about eight of us um, that I co-led along with uh, the fantastic Libby Richards. Uh, but what was the Secretariat's role with spy -M? So the Secretariat we basically did everything that wasn't in the modelling itself. So I normally describe my role as one of translation. So firstly, I had to translate from policy into maths, and then I had to translate back from maths into policy. So just in thinking about the life cycle of a piece of work, um, I'd start off firstly by having to set the agenda, which it sounds pretty trivial, but is actually really quite hard because the demand for our modelling was considerably higher than we could possibly supply. And most of the sort of things we were being asked to do were in areas where modelling just couldn't possibly help. You know, the example I always use is when uh, people were trying to ask us about opening nail bars and hair salons. And, you know, that isn't a question where, where modelling can help. But if you're being asked that by someone very senior, it's not straightforward to explain why I'm not going to do this thing for you. Um, so, yeah, often we had to work out what the next policy decision was going to have to be and therefore set up ways in which uh, maths and modelling could help. And, um, yeah, there's a bit of a fallacy that uh, modelling is a crystal ball, that it can make predictions, whereas really what you're trying to do is just tease out three or four bullet points that are relevant for policy. So we do a lot of thinking about how modelling could answer those questions then uh, send long emails to modelers on a Thursday or Friday, uh, ruining their weekends yet again um, with their demands, requests, uh, uh, polite um, requests uh, for them to do some more work for us. Um, then just before meeting, we'd get two or three long maths papers that I'd try to uh, summarize into what I thought the three or four bullet points for policy were. Um, Make sure the meeting itself can uh, really kick the tires of the work. Make sure that we're properly convinced that it answers the questions robustly and uh, whether or not the conclusions I had conceived of on my reading of the papers, whether they were right or not, you know, often they were, often they were right. Then once the meeting's done, uh, they'd be frantically writing up uh, the results um, into what we call a consensus statement. Um, so that 
was the main output of the committee and that's normally something that me or Libby would uh, very rapidly write up in a few hours on a Wednesday evening uh, before getting it signed off by the chairs which really summarised the conclusions and also try to lay out why the conclusions were true rather than just asserting them. Um, I found something that was really helpful was to um, kind of play the naive role. Um, I would often ask what I would often ask questions to which everyone in the room would know the answer purely to start a conversation and purely uh, and, and, and partly so that uh, I could then write that down as a conclusion of the committee. So one of the things, you know, we learned fairly early on is something that's really obvious to a mathematician is entirely unobvious to the general public. So a lot of the time, simply stating what they thought was obvious was really useful, both for the policy officials who were observing the meetings and for their documentations themselves. Have you got an example of that? I think an early example would be about the lags in the system. So one of the challenges was that there was, uh, I think, a, a big lag between someone being infected, some starting having symptoms, and then between someone having symptoms to ending up um, in hospital. And in the first few months of the pandemic, we didn't have widespread testing, and therefore we would only have a decent indication of the number of infected people uh, when they ended up in hospital two weeks later. So the result of that is, if we were to, you know, lock down on the 23rd of March, it would be two weeks-ish before you'd start seeing any evidence in the data, and maybe about a week after that before you could reliably tell a trend, because, you know, these numbers were quite noisy. And that's the sort of thing that any infectious disease modeler would know without thinking about it. Uh, but a policy person wouldn't. Uh, and therefore, if you're making a decision about whether or not to introduce a lockdown or in a similar measure, you need to know that you're thinking about how many people are going to be in hospital in three weeks' time based on the current trend. So simply by, you know, having discussions about that, you know, using up five, ten minutes of a meeting where you've got too much to, to cover, you, you really make sure that the advice you are giving to policy can be accurate and as clear as possible. So your role as a translator was was really in two directions. You had to translate from the policy requests, the information for policy. So one way from what the government would want to the modelers and then back again from the modelers on that first direction. So who's like, how did you know what policy questions were happening or did you have to preempt what you thought was going to happen? It was a bit of both. So I say we got asked a lot of things and some of them we could do, um, but oftentimes those requests would just come in far too late. You know, you'd get a request on a Wednesday saying they need to make this policy decision on a Thursday and uh, even by SPIM standards, that is not doable. Uh, but and a lot of it was just the political and the policy savvy, you know, we had to, any, any scraps of free time, you know, you'd be reading the papers, trying to work out what ministers are briefing confidentially uh, to the Daily Telegraph and therefore what you are going to be asked to do. And so the so those questions are coming in from um, the requirements of government departments or something needing to make some policy decisions like the nail bars. Um, and that, and then you 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 turn that into a mathematical what could be tackled mathematically, um, and then how did you go about then working with? So that's one direction, and then how did you go about taking that to the mathematicians? Have you got a background in in mathematics and epidemiology to know which questions were reasonable to be asked? Yeah. So. Um... When the music stopped at the start of the pandemic, um, I found myself in this role and um, in charge basically of all uses of infectious disease modelling for policy, not just pandemics. And uh, conveniently, 
uh, I'm probably about one, the, the only uh, one of the 420,000 civil servants who has a PhD in infectious disease modeling and several years of experience doing analysis for policy, um, which, yeah, was never something I had planned, uh, but worked out very nicely that, yeah, I had a foot in both camps. You know, I knew some of the modelers for my previous life um, and I had a fairly good idea of what goes into policy making. Thank uh, goodness so, yeah. that when the music stopped, you were in that particular seat. <laughs> well, my predecessor had been in the role for 12 years before retiring. Um, and, you know, he had to deal with swine flu in 2009, which was obviously uh, several orders of magnitude different to, to what we had to. Um, and I was keenly aware throughout my time in the role that something like this could happen. And I was always kind of hoping it would be a few weeks after I left rather than uh, while I was still doing the job. <laughs> well, um, when you did the job, one of the things I heard in what you were saying about timelines requests would come in on Wednesday, but we had to meet on a Thursday. And that was the impression, this really tight timeline was something we got the impression of when we were working with Juniper researchers. So what was the kind of timeline that you were working to? How long did you have to come up with the modeling requests? How long did the modelers have to get back to you? How long did you have to output your consensus statements? So that varied quite a lot, depending at uh, what the time period we, we were in. So in the first few months, um, it's fair to say that uh, we didn't have a proper routine. You know, the way that government was set up shifted quite a lot on a regular basis. Um, decisions were being made really rapidly uh, and, and not in uh, a... Uh, <laughs> Decisions were being made really rapidly and not in a way that could be predicted uh, more than a few days in advance. So at that time, you know, Sage was meeting twice a week. Spyam was meeting twice a week. We'd often be getting four or five actions out of a Sage meeting uh, that were needing to be done within a few days. And we could do some of them. We couldn't do some of the others. And you would sometimes get situations where um, I'm thinking the, the the Monday, the 16th of March, which was 2020, which was the pseudo lockdown, if you remember that, when we were told not to go to pubs, but told pubs weren't going to close, um, where, you know, we had a scheduled with Spyam in the morning, Sage at lunchtime, and then Cobra meeting uh, on, on the afternoon, uh, and with the announcement being made, I think it was about five o'clock. So it was, uh, yeah, it was somewhat challenging timelines that you know you couldn't really say no to yeah so sometimes it was even hours you had to have things ready in hours uh, we don't yes um depending exactly what we were being asked for yeah. we, we could certainly give advice within within hours even if it wasn't new modeling but then as we got more into the swing of things when things were working really well um so say 2021 where we were gradually going through what's called the roadmap where we were lose every four weeks um restrictions were being lifted uh, that for that period things were really quite predictable we knew in advance this is what we are going to be doing in four weeks time so we could have a policy dis change being made one day then after a couple of weeks um you could have enough e evidence we could start looking at the data uh, you could have one practice run of modeling and then what the week after that have the final run so modelers in that case would kind of have one or two weeks to do the work, uh, which was far more sustainable and led to much better outputs mm -hmm. and uh, much better policy decisions in the end. So you had to figure out which things were obvious to the modelers that you still needed to ask the questions about in order to get that information to the policy makers so that they so you had to know both sides really you had to you definitely was a translation effort both in terms of the words you used but also what information you knew each side needed I suppose exactly and you know the one we always struggled with and never really found an answer to it was exponential growth which yet again to a mathematician, it's really obvious that even though numbers are changing very little at the moment, that <laughs> before you know it, things are going to go haywire. Um, and yeah, even once everyone in the country had started talking about exponential growth or using, you know, sort of understood what it want, what it was, it, it's still really counterintuitive and it's still really hard to uh, 
get people to see the consequences of it, uh, if, especially if they choose not to. Look at it. And they, do they only really recognise the exponential growth when it's on the sharp vertical climb as opposed to the early stage? Is that the... I think we as humans are very good at persuading ourselves of what we want to believe. And mm. if you want to believe that everything's okay, then you can certainly persuade yourself that, yeah, this low levels of, of people in hospital increasing only very slightly is not a problem and is going to stay not mm. a problem. Mm. And uh, when what was some what were some of the challenges you had given that you were writing these consensus statements? I know they were going to Sage, but um, my impression was you realised that they were going to be read like by people like me and journalists and government um, figures who aren't mathematicians. What were some of the challenges that you had in conveying such complex scientific information to audiences who weren't scientifically trained? So I think you just hit on the first one there, which is that we didn't have an audience. We had several different audiences and the different audiences have different uh, levels of knowledge and they'll want something different out of it. Uh, so firstly, we had you know, Sage himself, experts. He had to be uh, completely technically accurate um, and, and correct, of course. Um, and then secondly, you had ministers or ministers advisors more, more often who you knew were going to pick up uh, the, the the consensus statement and were going to try to tear apart your conclusions um, and had to justify them. So you had to lay it out in a way that not only stated the conclusions, but really led these people to believe them and come to the same conclusions themselves, uh, which isn't an easy thing to do. Then you had the media um, and there was, a, like you say, lots of press interest in what we were writing and that meant had to be incredibly careful with the language that we used you know that a couple of stray words would end up on the front page of a paper um, by the end of the week if you weren't quite really tight in your drafting then you got the general public and you know it was fantastic the number of downloads we got of our papers from uh, just normal people out there um, really brought home the interest for, for this sort of thing um, and of course everyone in public has different levels of experience but none of them are or very few of them are mathematicians and then finally you've got the policy civil servants who uh, like I say are speaking policies rather than English um, and therefore you need to cover their backs so trying to draft something like that to cover all the different audiences you know was was hard I'm not going to pretend we got it right um, clearly there are were plenty of times where our modeling was uh, either deliberately or otherwise misinterpreted in the media or in the political world. And yeah, uh, like I say, I'm not going to pretend that we got that right every time, but I think certainly as we went on, we got a lot better uh, at doing what we were doing. And it's interesting as well, there's like language differences, I can imagine, because there's definitely languages, the way language is used in maths can mean different things to the wider public. Um, an example someone alerted me to recently was threshold. So a threshold for vaccination was like 90%, but it's not that you want it to end there. It's like you have to get past it and keep going. Whereas for a policy um, perspective, threshold is like a target. And once you hit it, you can relax. So uh, yeah, I guess there's examples of strange use of language on both sides of that conversation. Absolutely. I mean, I think the classic example is uh, herd immunity which is, you know, is a perfectly standard term in infectious disease, in epidemiology, um, that we, everyone on the committee or on the secretariat would know what it is and, and, and what it means. But it had other connotations in the early days of the pandemic. Uh, and therefore, if we were to be using that particular term, then you know that it would get interpreted um, incorrectly. So... Yeah, there were examples like that where you would use alternative terms or just be incredibly careful with what you're saying because you know that different bits of the audience are going to, to interpret in a way that was never intended. Originally, I, we were writing these things not expecting them to be in the public domain and there was a decision made. Uh, Chris Whitty, Patrick Valance decided they wanted to make all the papers public and... 
uh, I'll put my hands up and say uh, I was wrong. I, I thought that that was a bad idea. I thought that uh, because we had not written them with the public in mind, that they'd be misinterpreted and thought the whole thing would be used as a stick to beat us with. Uh, but I was completely wrong. Uh, I, I'm, I, yeah, it was the best decision that uh, was made. Uh, best decision, one of the very best things they did of the whole pandemic uh, was making things public. Not only did it improve the uh, transparency for transparency's sake, but it also massively improved what we were writing. You know, when we were writing with, uh, you know, an imaginary journalist on one shoulder, a politician on another shoulder, and uh, if I had a third shoulder, it would be my mum looking over the shoulder, someone who's very intelligent but doesn't know about infectious disease modelling. Um, it massively improved what we wrote. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it was a fantastic thing to have done. And it wasn't the case in all countries. And I think it's really a lesson that could be used not just for the government, but for all kinds of decision makers out there that, you know, having public scrutiny really does improve decision making. I'm not going to expect that, you know, my local council's uh, analysis or uh, uh, policy making process is going to get as much attention as lockdown was. But there's definitely a market out there for intelligent non-experts to uh, to look at what you've been doing and to improve it. Because we we met at the uh, communicating mathematics for the public event at the Newton Gateway in Cambridge, and that came out in so many things that transparency for transparency's sake is important, um, but it also in, improves your writing. But also there was this sense that it's the way of giving people faith, even if they don't go and read all the things, the fact that they know all that information is there for them should they want it makes it, it makes everyone more accountable and hopefully increases faith in the decision making that's happening. So yeah, and I'm I'm pretty sure that it improved what decisions were being made as well. So I'm sure that yeah, it saved more lives and uh, reduced economic damage because all that stuff was out there. I mean, it's, it struck me that um, the wider community became really aware of the importance of data and modelling in a way that they wouldn't have ever um, been aware of it before. But was there any examples where suddenly you saw people use maths that came from SPIM in a really good way or they suddenly understood something that that maybe they would never have come across before? I... I think the example I'd use here is uh, the R number, which is, for those of us who remember, uh, is the number of people that you would expect one infected person to infect at a given time. So if that number is greater than one, the epidemic grows. If that number is less than one, the epidemic shrinks. And I remember really quite just before the pandemic, having also just for the lockdown having uh, an emergency haircut where I, I i managed to have half a saturday off and thought i'm just going to have a haircut and i'm going to go to the opticians and going to do all these things that i don't think i'm necessarily going to be able to do for a while and i overheard the person at the barber's chair next to me talking about this r number thing and i'm like yeah this this is real this is, uh, you know, the man on the Clapham omnibus, the man uh, down the dog and duck is talking about these mathematical concepts. And yeah, I remember just two months earlier writing a briefing to the chief medical officer and uh, and his deputies, which included an explanation of what the R, R number was. And yeah, two months on, everyone's talking about it. And yeah, that is it's quite surreal as, as so much of it was yeah. incredibly surreal. And I suppose as well, it was such a, you know, it was a live pandemic affecting everyone's life. So I guess it was you were writing about things that were going to impact people's daily lives and people who were losing people, you know, to the disease. So lots of emotion there. I imagine that maybe wasn't a normal part of daily life in your work before. Yeah, that I mean, that was one of the other challenges. You know, we were working in this environment, which was uh, incredibly high pressured. Uh, and relentless, you know, for for a couple of years, and turning around these consensus statements and the modelers doing their modelling in really really short deadlines, 
So, yeah, you don't have a chance to do, you know, seven or eight drafts to make sure that your uh, language is exactly perfect. You don't get the chance to do the detailed user research that you uh, might have wanted to do. And uh, yeah, you have to put your own emotions in a box, given that, you know, all of us were going through the same situation, you know, all of us were having to deal with personally with uh, being locked up and in our homes and, you know, not having toilet paper or uh, homeschooling kids or w whatever you're dealing with. So, yeah, it's it's a, a lot more difficult doing this in practice than it might have been in theory. So given it was obviously an incredibly challenging time, but was there any positive things for you? Like, was there anything that you learnt or experienced that you take away with you as something you're glad that you've learned or happy to have done? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was incredibly hard um, and the, the emotional and physical toll on all of us was, was, was awful. But it was really an honour to be able to spend so much time with so many intelligent people. You know, I'm not just talking about Spy M. You know, I learned a vast amount of maths, far more on an average Wednesday at Spy M than I ever did, you know, in a term worth of lectures as an undergrad or, you know, a month of my PhD. Uh, but also the, the being able to sit in and observe in SAGE meetings where, you know, there were virologists, immunologists, engineers, public health people, medics, like things I know nothing about or I knew nothing about. Now I know a tiny bit. but you know, just being able to listen to the world's expert in virology talking about T cells and uh, B cells and all that sort of thing. Uh, it, yeah, it's an extraordinary privilege. Or being able to, you know, send a, a Slack message to, you know, a couple of fellows of the Royal Society, uh, you know, professors in Cambridge and OBEs and the like, just, just to ask a maths question that I never really understood as an undergrad, but, but now I do. So, yeah, I... I learned so much both on the technical side of things also on, about myself you know did a lot of in of of working out how i work best uh, about leading a team under that sort of pressure about motivating people about uh, what you can do you know turns out that it's kind of like when uh you know the stories you hear uh, about mothers lifting up a car because their baby's trapped underneath it. it kind of felt a bit like that at times you know when you back really up against the wall you can do so much more than you uh, can plausibly do in in normal life um so yeah all of us wish the pandemic had never happened but you, you know just given it did uh just incredibly fortunate to have been in the position i was um and to work with such a fantastic uh, secretariat as well uh, they were absolutely immense um, and yeah being able to change people's lives for the better is is why I take, took this career decision uh, why I joined the civil service in the first place why I uh, wanted to use data to, to change policy and absolutely got the chance to do that uh, in spades. That's very interesting oh well Tom thanks very much for talking to us that's been that's been brilliant. Thanks for having me it's been great fun. Thanks. That was Tom Irving talking to my colleague Rachel Thomas. You can watch a recording of the talk Tom gave at the event at the Newton Gateway by going to gateway.newton.ac.uk and searching for Communicating Mathematics. To listen to previous episodes of On the Mathematical Frontline, go to plus.maths.org slash juniper. And there you can also find many articles covering the work of Juniper members. That's it for this edition of the PLUS podcast. Thanks for listening and bye-bye.